everyone's doing well today. Uh, thanks for coming out. I know there's a lot of different panels to talk to choose from, so that's it. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about how to use the ASUS Tinker Board with Electronics Project release, how I've been using it. Uh, this will be a quick and simple demo, and they are actually running on the Tinker Board right now using LibreOffice on DBNOS. Uh, so this is truly a Tinker Board presentation. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Liz. I have a YouTube channel called Blitz City DIY. Uh, I do a lot of different types of electronics projects, coding, 3D printing, Linux. Uh, you'll see a lot of LEDs and NeoPixels on my channel as well as a hefty helping of Circuit Python. Uh, another topic near and dear to my heart is the ASUS Tinker Board, which is the topic for today. Uh, Tinker Board is a single board computer, not unlike the Orange Pi, Odroid, of course, I think everyone's favorite, including mine, Raspberry Pi. Uh, it utilizes a Rock Chip 3288 system on chip which has some decent power to it, makes it a good fit for media applications, uh, and other more CPU intensive tasks. Uh, of course it can run Linux, but it also has an ASUS managed Android OS, uh, because uh, ASUS actually uses the Rock Chip 3288 for a lot of its smartphones, so it's easy to kind of port it. When the Tinkerboard originally came out about two years ago, I dove right in and I was doing a few videos on Project on it because it, it really excited me that ASUS being a mainstream computer and tech company was taking the time to develop and support a single board computer that was utilizing Linux. And I saw it being used also by some people that are more into PC gaming and the PC building scene um, just because it was from ASUS and then they got more into open source as a result. So if it could expose people to more open source technology that maybe wouldn't have thought about using it before, um, I just thought that was really cool. Uh, and this led me to writing a book on the Tinkerboard called uh, Practical Tinkerboard that was published by a press. Uh, I approached the book by basically going through a guided tour of the Tinkerboard so that a beginner could follow along and not get lost in the weeds. Since we wrote from the perspective of what I wish I had known both starting out with Tinkerboard and also with Linux. Because uh, it's intimidating when you get this board and you take it out of the box and if you've only ever used like a standard laptop or desktop before, it's kind of weird because it's basically just this bare PCB and you don't really know what to do with it. And same with Linux, like, granted it has more of a GUI desktop now, but if you've only used Windows or Mac OS, it can just be kind of funky. So I just kind of wanted to take the mystery out of it because it shouldn't be mysterious. Uh, and now just a little bit more background on Tinkerboard hardware. Uh, there are two versions of the Tinkerboard available. There's the original Tinkerboard, which I'm using right here, and the Tinkerboard S. Tinkerboard S basically just has some mild improvements and new features, a bit specialized, and on the chart on the slides there you can see kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, you can kind of think of it how the Raspberry Pi 3B compares to the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. It's the same architecture, same system on chip, but there's some improvements nonetheless, and depending on your use case, you may be uh, more interested in it. Uh, probably for me, the most noble feature of the S board is 16 gigabytes of onboard eMMC. This means you don't need an SD card to run your OS. It can just be loaded directly onto the board. And if you're like me and you've ever bumped the SD card when you're running it and totally crashed your OS, then you can see why that would be handy. Uh, the S, though, it also needs a bigger power supply, 5 volts, 3 amps. I've never been able to get it to boot with anything less than that. I know on the chart it says it can, but I, I've never had any luck. Um, and this can be a good thing to keep in mind if you're maybe writing a book on the board and switching between the two boards and you forget which one you're trying to boot up and the S won't boot up. There is a way to visually tell them apart though. The original Tinker board has this really pretty blue teal silkscreen, whereas the S has this very stealth uh, navy blue silkscreen. Why would you want to use a Tinker board, especially when there are so many different single board computers out there with varying communities and software support, everything like that? First off, still pretty young. It just celebrated its second birthday. That means there's still a lot of uncharted territory. Chances are your project that you're thinking of or you've done before hasn't been done on the Tinker board. And so, but if you choose to document and share it, which I hope you would, uh, you'll be contributing to community support for the board. Uh, another thing I want to mention is the dedicated uh, OS for Android. It's really sleek, it works, it doesn't crash. Uh, there's ways to get the Google Play Store running on it so you can have basically a full like Android TV, uh, especially with the Rock Chip working so well for media applications. It's definitely something to think about. And speaking of the Rock Chip, um, where the hardware makes a great candidate for media projects, means this also translates really, really well for electronics projects as well. Because when you're using a single board computer for your projects, Basically you have everything plus the kitchen sink. On board you have 
HDMI output, you have USB, Ethernet, um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. You don't have to worry about plugging in different modules and managing different libraries. It's just a matter of making sure that it's enabled in the OS. Uh, and so speaking of electronics project, let's go a little bit more in detail on that. Uh, so for programming with hardware, there are libraries with ASUS for both C and Python. C library is basically a port of wiring Pi, which if you've ever programmed in C on a Raspberry Pi, then you're familiar with it. You can see some C example code on the slides there. Felt like C wasn't getting a lot of love lately, so I wanted to give it a shout out. Uh, if you use Python, utilize the asus.gpio library, which can run right in idle, which comes pre-installed on Ticker OS, which is the Debian distro from Asus. And it also runs in both Python 2 or Python 3, if you have a preference. Uh, and you probably guess it's a port of the rpi.gpio library, uh, which is one way to use the GPIO pins with the Python on a Pi. Uh, so the Tinkerboard definitely owes a lot to the Raspberry Pi for um, the integration with the GPIO pins. Um, and speaking of GPIO pins, there are 40 of them, uh, and they're broken on the board. Convenient feature that the header on both of the versions of the Tinkerboard is color-coded, so you can see each pin's function really easily. Uh, so you can see in the picture, green is your kind of general inputs and outputs, uh, red is 5 volts, the yellowy mustard colors is 3.3 volts, uh, black is brown, and the two blue pins on there are SCL and ST, SDA for I squared C communication, my personal favorite. Uh, now there's also um, hats that exist for Raspberry Pi, and they can be used with the Tinkerboard. But in most cases, you can port the code libraries by changing the syntax to match what the ASUS and GPIO libraries are looking for. Uh, in my experience, boards that communicate with I squared C work pretty seamlessly, especially ones from Adafruit. Uh, SPI can be a little fussy, but when isn't it? Uh, usually the bus number needs to be adjusted. Uh, for a while, the kernel actually wasn't supporting bus zero, but that's been resolved, which is good. Uh, a few boards have already been ported and are fully supported by the ASUS dev team, including a lot of boards from WaveShare that make a lot, a lot of e-paper displays, which are pretty popular right now. Now, um, electronics, I could talk about them all day, but it's way more fun to do a live demo and show you how it works. So we're going to blink an LED. And we're going to do this by uh, going into the terminal and opening up idle, which is a Python ID. And then we're going to do control new to bring up a new uh, Python uh, program. And we're going to start off by importing the asus.gpio library. We do that with import asus.gpio as gpio. And then we're going to import time because we're going to need that to uh, link our LEDs. So we're going to do that import time. And now we're going to do some GPIO setup. So first we're going to tell it uh, how the Tinkerboard is going to view the pins. And the ASUS.GPIO library allows you to use the physical pin numbers so that when you plug something into pin 7, you can then refer to it as pin 7 in your code. So you do that with GPIO dot set mode gpio dot board and then we're going to set up our led pin and we're going to do that by creating a variable led equals seven for pin seven it's also my lucky number um, and then we're going to set up that pin to be an output and we do that with gpio dot setup we're going to call on led and do gpio dot out and then that's all the setup we need. Now we can go into the loop, the portion of the code that's going to go over and over again to blink our LED. And so using Python syntax, we're going to do try, and then while true. And then we're going to have uh, the GPIO pen send that signal to the LED to turn it on. We're going to do that with GPIO dot output. We're going to call on LED again, and then do GPIO dot high, which will send a pulse to that pin to turn on the LED. And since we're going to be running the script uh, in Linux in the terminal, we can print some text to kind of debug. We can do that with print, and keep it simple, LED on. And then uh, we're going to put in the delay so that the LED is on for one second of time, dot sleep, one. And now we're going to need to flip that and reverse it and turn the LED off. And we're going to do that with gpio.output, 
call on LED again, and GPIO.low, which turns off the signal to the pin. And then we're going to also do some debugging with Prince LED off, so hopefully our text matches what our hardware is doing. And then we're going to do time.sleep one second again. And then since we used try, we're going to put in accept so that we can stop our script. Oh, I just gotta enter. Go to accept, and then with a keyboard interrupt, since we're gonna be running in the terminal. And then when we do that with control C, we're gonna do gpio.cleanup, which will kind of reset our GPI opens. And so, as I said, we're gonna be running this in the terminal, and to do that, we're going to need it to make it an executable. And we do that with a quick uh, line of bash script at the top, starting with hashtag exclamation point, which is a shebang, and then slash user, slash bin, slash environment, and then Python. And so now we can save our script, uh, and let's call it Maker Fair Bay Area. Save, and then we'll close out. So now we're back in the terminal, and we just need to change the mode of that Python script so that it's an executable. Right now it just exists as kind of a file in Python. So we do that with change mode, which is chmod, and then plus x, which makes it executable. And then we're going to do the name of the Python script with a .py extension, so makerfairbayarea.py. And as you can see, nothing happened. Uh, and that's because everything happened behind the, behind the scenes. But for a beginner, it could be a little confusing. You just enter in this thing and you're like, I, I think it worked. I don't really know. Nothing's telling me whether or not. Uh, so now we can really test to see if it works by uh, executing it as an executable. We do that with sudo and then our name, whoops. We do sudo point slash makerfairbayarea.py. And I did the wrong direction slash, which is also a common mistake. We do that sudo point slash makerfairbayarea.py. Or maybe I didn't. Um, I have another version that I did when I was testing. So we'll do sudo point slash seven .py. There we go. As you can see with this lovely Pikachu board, the LED is blinking. And I'm going to take a moment to drink some water. Aren't live demos exciting? <laughs> All right, and so I can edit, end it by going Control C. As you can see, the script stops, and also the Pikachu is no longer showing off his red cheeks. Uh, but I can also just enter in the script again, and we're running it again, and Pikachu is showing off his cheeks again. Um, and that's what I really like about doing development on a single board computer with a terminal. It's just really easy to start and stop your code and edit things really quickly. Uh, but let's go back to the slides. Uh, these were the backup slides just in case things didn't work. Um, I just want to point out the fritzing diagram. I did make a fritzing object for the Tinker board that's available on GitHub if you're interested. Uh, just, it's fun to make fritzing objects, I definitely recommend it. Uh, but of course, you wouldn't get Tinker board to blink an LED, or at least I hope you wouldn't, uh, because there's a lot more options uh, for it. As I said, when you're using a single board computer for development, uh, you kind of have everything in the kitchen sink. Uh, so I want to talk about two projects that are in my book, they're a little bit more advanced, and kind of utilize all the features available. Uh, and first up is an e-paper weather display. Uh, it utilizes an e-paper hat with a 40-pin GPIO header. This is one of the ones from WaveShare that I mentioned that uh, ASUS is fully supporting, it's already ported. And I utilized it in my board specifically because of that, so that a beginner could buy the e-paper display, plug it in, not have to worry about porting the code. They're just kind of worrying about their own code instead of maybe something else that's gone wrong. Uh, and it is coded in Python, utilizes the Open Weather Map API, Pyome, which is this really awesome API, uh, has a lot of different features. You can go a little bit further than just the status of the weather or the temperature. And you can also use Celsius or Kelvin for your temperature if you're living literally anywhere but the United States. Uh, and it's uh, really well documented as well. Now the script is stored in the if up folder, 
so that once uh, the Tinkerboard boots and a network connection is established, uh, the Tinkerboard can basically run as headless, not connected to a monitor, and the Python script will just run on the e-paper display. So you can basically have this um, weather display that just needs power to run, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, then another one is a Bluetooth-controlled rover robot with a camera. Uh, just kind of a basic rover robot. And it utilizes the Adafruit motor hatch, one of those shields that works over I2C. Uh, and it was really seamless to get the code running. I was able to use the Adafruit library, didn't need to edit anything, and they kept the code really streamlined. Uh, it is coded in Python. Uh, it utilizes the MIPI camera, which is connected via the CSI connector, which is located right next to the HDMI port. Uh, and that camera is streaming over MJPEG Streamer, uh, which means you can view the camera feed in a browser on your network. So basically the idea is you're driving around this robot, and you could be at your desk, but maybe the robot's in another room, you can see what the robot's seeing. Uh, and I also included in the book a uh, homebrew Bluetooth controller using Adafruit uh, Bluetooth Feather Board, and this communicates text commands with the ReadChar Python library. The way that works is in your Python script, uh, you basically call on these different text commands that are going to be controlling different actions with the GPI opens. And then you run the Python script as an executable in the terminal. The terminal is then able to take in those text inputs and communicate with the Python script. So basically, I used kind of a classic WASD um, control so that if I press W on a keyboard, it sends the robot forward, S sends it backwards, and you get the idea. Uh, and then this is also running as headless because it'd be kind of a pain to run your uh, robot to a monitor and a keyboard and mouse every time you want to use it. Uh, so there's uh, two things happening to make that work. First, there's a bash script to run the MGIN JPEG streamer because you have to run it in the terminal to have all your different options available. Uh, and that's in the network if up folder, same as the ePaper display, uh, so that once the Tinkerboard is both booted up and network connection is established, it will run and your camera stream will start. And then the second part of it, the Python script for the uh, actual robot is uh, running in the auto start folder as a bash script since it has to run as an executable in the terminal to be able to receive those read char inputs. Uh, and the reason why I kept those separated is so that if I power up the Tinkerboard but there's no Wi-Fi that day, your robot's still going to work. You're just not going to have that camera feed because uh, it'd be a shame to have an IoT robot that would run. Uh, so that's going to bring an end to the talk. Um, I really love working with single board computers and Linux in general. Um, my goal is to see it become more accessible and for people to not be afraid of it, because it can be really intimidating, but there's so much available um, in the open source community that I'm hoping is making it more accessible to beginners. Um, so thank you for coming out. Uh, Practical Tinkerboard is available from Oppress and Amazon. If you'd like to hear me uh, talk about other topics like this, uh, you can find me on blitzdiy.com. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel, Twitter, and Instagram at BlitzCityDIY. So, thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the pin compatibility with the Raspberry Pi? Uh, so it has basically an identical pinout to the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and so that makes it so that a lot of the add-on boards will work with just some basically syntax editing. Uh, the, there are a few boards that have been ported um, by ASUS and other people in the community, but it's definitely still an ongoing thing. So if it's something you'd be interested in seeing, that would be something to kind of um, look at to help with the community support for it. Anybody else? No? Okay, thank you.